Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to give people uh, one minute afterwards uh, to join this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, thank you for joining Changing the Game, the Visibility of Trans Men in the South, Key Findings webinar. My name is Marvell Terry II, and I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Southern HIV Impact Fund at Age United. I will also serve today as your moderator and your host. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on Age United's website as well as Game Changing Men's website. Also, the report that we will be referencing will also be held on Age United's website and Game Changing Men website as well. I would like to provide an overview of our agenda today. First, we will kick it off from a welcome from Age United provided by Athena Quals. There will be a welcome from Quentin Reynolds and Game Changing Men. Quentin will also provide the why behind the survey that we will be referencing uh, throughout this webinar. Next, we will have an overview of the key findings. Afterward, you will hear from community voices who took, who took this survey and saw the importance of this work. And then finally, we will close this webinar out with our call to vision, a vision for the future. I would now like to introduce you to Athena Cross. Athena is a healthcare leader with over 15 years of experience leading market access initiatives, insurance, contracting, healthcare reimbursement, public policy, healthcare strategy in the public and private sectors. She specializes in improving the public health care delivery system and has also led several initiatives and developed numerous strategies to improve and increase access to reproductive health and women's health services. Please help me welcome Athena Quals, the Vice President and Chief Program Officer at Age United. Hello, everyone. Um, and Marvel, thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, I, um, my name again is Athena Cross. I'm the Vice President and Chief Program Officer here at AIDS United. I am so honored to have the opportunity to welcome you all to the launch of the Changing the Game, the Visibility, visibility of Trans Men in the South survey. As a mother of a thriving trans man, no issue is closer to my heart than creating spaces for people of trans experience to live authentically and freely. The work of brain game-changing men is building the groundwork for trans visibility. So our trans brothers and sisters, sons and daughters can live and thrive. Thank you to Marvell and the shift team, to our communications team and to Vienna and Bergaya, and to everyone at Game Changing Men for all of their amazing work and for making this happen. I am very honored to introduce the rest of this team and um, share the wonderful information uh, that we have learned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Athena. Next, we will have a welcome from Quentin Reynolds. Quentin is, the, is currently the founder and executive director from Game Changing Man and founder and lead consultant for Quentin Reynolds Consulting. His work with Game Changing Man focuses on erasing stigma and barriers for the progression of Black trans masculine men in society by addressing toxic masculinities and promoting health 
to end violence and ensure the safety and wellness for communities of color. Please help me welcome Quentin Reynolds, who will provide a welcome from Game Changing Men and also provide a why to this survey. Thanks, Marvell, for the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. On behalf of Game Changing Men, I'm Quentin Reynolds, the executive director for the organization. I want to give a special thanks to everyone who responded to this survey. Without you, this uh, press release and the findings that we have found, we would not have those. So thank you. And we reach way past our initial target and we are so happy that we were able to do that. Thank you so much. Um, wanted to give another thanks to Marvell for believing in our mission and our goals to reach trans men in the South. Uh, uh, thanks to the shift team at Age United team for all your work on this press release and the survey. Also to the amazing evaluator of this survey, Vianna, thank you so much. Special thanks to our fiscal sponsor, um, Dwayne Crowder at A Vision for Hope and our sister organization, TWLC Healing Project, for your efforts on this survey and for your support of all the work that uh, we are doing at Game Changing Men. I wanna thank today's speakers, Jamel, D. Jamel and Manny for your work and for being visible in all the work you are doing. I founded Game Changing Men out of the need to have more supportive spaces for trans men and trans masculine folk. Our mission is to erase stigma and barriers for progression of black trans men in society. All of our programs seek to address our whole selves and we are led by black trans organization and founded. The core leadership consists of black and people of color trans individuals, all of our programs combats stigma and barriers. At Game Changing Men, we, we take a non-traditional approach to engage trans masculine folks. And how we do that is by creating non-judgment zones that allow folks to show up as they are and just live the truth. We believe that in services that we provide will help inspire our youth. In order for us to be seen, we believe that representation and visibility visibility for trans men will be key to accessing resources needed. So why did we do this survey? We did this survey because we wanted to provide, as we provided spaces and, and had difficult conversations and, and created bonding sessions, we became aware that it was a common denominator within all of those conversations, which was the lack of representation for trans men and trans masculine folks in data, research, and in visibility. With the limited resources set aside for a demographic trans men, trans masculine folks, which has been invisible to most people and most resources. I wanted to hear something different than other than a trans woman narrative. So the stories, the narratives, the trans men and trans masculine folks has been almost erased and we don't have almost any tangible information. So as an organization that prides itself on bringing representation and visibility for trans masculine folk and trans men, we knew that we needed to capture the true needs within the community. So as a trans man myself, I know the lack of resources, the lack of access to care for resources that's needed. Over my years of advocacy, I've learned that stigmas attached to sexual health, reproductive health, and mass incarceration has created so many barriers for trans men and trans masculine folks to even access resources or access supportive spaces. Everyone affected by HIV must be included in ending the HIV epidemic. That includes trans men and trans masculine folk. We wanted this survey to highlight some of the barriers, but also show the need of trans men and trans masculine folk to access prevention, contraceptive, contraceptive methods, and other resources to add to the quality of life, but also everyday living. This survey brings great visibility to the existence of trans men and trans masculine folks, but it tells a small part of our story. 
This survey is knocking down doors of stigma, societal barriers, and any exclusion that misrepresents trans men and trans masculine folk. Trans men and trans masculine folk exist. We deserve to be um, heard and visible. Trans men and trans masculine folks exist. We come in all different shapes, sizes, masculinity, femininity, and we will not continue to live in the box that was created for us. This is just the beginning to hear real stories, barriers, and issues that everyday trans men and trans masculine folks face. And as an organization and as a community leader over the uh, Game Changer Man, we will continue to be the voice when needed and a resources to seek uh, a resource hub to seek um, services and resources for trans men and trans masculine folk. And with that, I'll hand it back to Marvell. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much uh, for that welcome and telling us the why and the drive behind this survey. Uh, thank you, Quentin and Game Changing Men um, for this report for sure. Next, I would like to discuss our methodology and our key findings. Um, I would like to bring up Vianna Mbengaya. Uh, Vianna has over a decade of experience in supporting public and private organizations at the international, federal, state, and community levels. Her work has led to opportunities for innovative research, in the areas of COVID-19, HIV and AIDS, malaria, reproductive health, and social behavioral health. Her expertise includes infectious disease epidemiology, behavioral health surveillance, clinical research coordination, and program evaluation. She holds a master's degree in epidemiology and biostatistics from George Washington University, School of Public Health and Health Services, and a bachelor's degree in biology from Boston College. Please help me welcome Vienna and Bengaya. Thank you, Marvell, for the lovely introduction, and thank you to everyone for making the time to be here. Uh, today, I hope this presentation opens your eyes to, or opens your mind actually, to how we can continue to care for each other as we uh, fight to end the HIV epidemic. So first, let's talk about the methods. You heard Quentin, the, the, the Quentin Reynolds, the founder, talk about the why of the survey. So now I'll break down how it actually happened. So the Game Changing Survey had a total of 1,200 resp responses between, the, uh, between June and September of 2022. And Game Changing Men successfully administered this survey to 334 participants in person at eight different events in the South. And uh, the rest were participants that uh, showed up via social media platforms. So now let's talk about uh, the first variable that we looked at, which was age. And as you see here, the majority of the participants were between the ages of 25 and 34. Uh, similarly, when we look at the 515 trans men that responded, we see the same thing. We had about 57% of them uh, between the ages of 25 and 34. So we found that older trans groups, older age groups uh, had lower attendance in general whether they were trans or not, uh, which was indicative of the events, the types of events that Game Changing Men uh, attended, as well as their social media reach. So how does this inform the larger conversation? Um, we know that currently there's a gap in trans masculine health, uh, long-term health research. Without strategies to better engage this age group, we're not able to learn, uh, we're not able to appropriately understand and meet the unique needs of older trans men. All right, so let's move on to the next one, which was race and ethnicity. And I'm just gonna tell you now, we realized really early that we, our target audience was grossly underrepresented. First, if, as, you, as you can see in the chart right here, African-Americans uh, made up uh, just about 191 respondents, very small number. And then uh, further analysis show that African-American trans men made up only 5.3% of this survey. So that's again, about 64 people out of 1200 respondents were African-American trans men. So we had an issue early on and we wanted to see what opportunities it would present. All right, so what opportunities did it present? Uh, we know particularly uh, in clinical settings, 
in order for us to build trust and gather insight on the healthcare needs of African-American trans men, strategies that lead to creating safe spaces, the ones that uh, uh, Quinton referenced earlier, um, we, need, we need those kinds of spaces. We need places where we can create, uh, we can empower healthcare providers to get informed and to competently engage with this group as needed. Um, it's not just about meeting people where they are, which is African-American trans men, but actually being prepared to receive them once you show up in front of them. All right, so let's go to the next one. Uh, we asked about engaging in sex work or survival sex work, which means exchanging sex for or sexual favors for food, a place to stay, drugs or alcohol or money or other resources as needed. In total, we had a, about over uh, a half, like 54% of people uh, overall said that they had either engaged in uh, sex or sex work or survival sex work now or in the past. So we have about 44, uh, 54% there. And then when we looked at the just the trans men that responded, we also found you know, about 50%, it was 49% specifically that of trans men who said they had engaged in sex work or survival sex work either now or previously. So given that these are high risk behaviors and obvious contributors to HIV and STI vulnerability, it made us reflect on the following. Uh, what does applied urgency on researching the specific high-risk behaviors of trans men look like? At the moment, sex work and survival sex work among trans men is now widely researched. Larger studies on this topic would offer statistically significant and rich data that can help surface additional high-risk patterns within this group. The next variable we looked at was incarceration. So overall, about 27% of respondents had been formally incarcerated. And among trans men respondents, we saw the same thing. It was about 35% had a history of incarceration. So what do we know to be true? We know that at a national level, trans identified adults have a 16% rate of incarceration compared to just 2% of cis adults. I'll say it again. At a national level, trans identified adults have a 16%, 16% rate of incarceration compared to just 2.7% of cis adults. So what does this uh, conspicuously disproportionate contact with law enforcement and the justice system do? It increases risk for discrimination, harassment, and violence. So advocacy for trans identifying individuals in especially, is especially vital in prisons, in jails, in immigration facilities, and where people are typically housed according to sex assigned at birth as opposed to gender identity. So in these settings, as I mentioned before, trans identifying folks are left vulnerable to attacks uh, and sexual assault from staff and other det detained people. Let's move on to the next one where we talked about care enrollment. Majority of folks, 65% as you see here, said they were currently enrolled in care. The same thing for trans men who responded, 81% of them are already enrolled in care. So what do we know about the experience of trans men once they are enrolled in care? We know that they are often hesitant to seek critical medical or mental health care due to the acknowledged deficits in the delivery of healthcare services uh, that is specific to this group. And uh, we're talking about transgender and gender non-conforming individuals, which I'll say TGNC moving forward. So how do we address this? First, we propose destigmatization of sexuality and gender identity within the healthcare system. Next, sexual orientation and gender identity training can be offered to all healthcare personnel as part of routine training. With an informed approach, healthcare personnel could garner the empathy and the competency needed to appropriately and respectfully engage this group. All right, so we're almost at the end here. The next one was STI prevention, STI prevention methods or birth control access. All right, so as you can see here, 68% of the survey respondents were saying, hey, I have access, uh, but we have 23 and another 9% who are saying, I do not have access or I actually do need, do need these important resources. When we focus on just trans men, similar, same thing. 81% of them are saying, yes, I have access to these uh, prevention methods and birth control. And 9%, 18% and another 1% are saying, eh, I either don't have it or I really do need access. So what does current literature, what did the current literature tell us about this? We know that trans men already face barriers communicating their sexual health needs in the healthcare system, in the healthcare system that has continued gaps in their acute needs. So what do we find here? We found that deficits in accessing STI prevention methods. I think we're gonna hit the next one here so we can see it up here in the slide. So yeah, deficits in accessing STI prevention methods and birth control resources warrant robust 
partnerships uh, between healthcare providers that offer trans-specific resources and trans men focused community-based organizations across the South. Such a network will be capable of linking uh, vulnerable and high risk populations to, to much needed healthcare services. All right, so we're here at the end and this final slide is two parts. So I'm gonna talk about the first uh, part of the, of the chart and we're focusing on people who have said these sexual health accessibility, these things are somewhat accessible or not at all accessible. So as you can see here, we're talking about STI prevention methods or birth control such as PrEP, condoms, dental dams, post-exposure prophylaxis. Now here we have about 57% of people total are saying either the access to this is somewhat accessible or not accessible at all. And we saw the same thing with trans men. We have about 61% of people saying, eh, somewhat accessible or not accessible at all. And then when we look at the latter part of the chart, we're asking about what is your, what is your uh, accessibility when it comes to uh, being connected to a provider that has knowledge that is knowledgeable in STI prevention methods and sexual health for TGNC individuals. Here we had about majority of people, about 56% of the people saying, you know what, I kind of have, you know, somewhat accessible and some people saying, I do not have access at all to um, a provider that is knowledgeable in TGNC individuals in their care. So out of the uh, trans men that responded, we saw that a uh, 59% of them were saying, eh, I don't know about that. And if you look at the research, what, is, what does the research support? We know that trans identifying indiv individuals, as I said before, do experience a lot of discrimination in healthcare settings and may feel uncomfortable seeking important medical care, such as pap tests for trans men or prostate exams for trans women. So this tells us that more non-judgmental spaces for trans men to seek guidance on sexual health, reproductive health, and, and such are considerably needed. There's a lack of trans visibility in the medical field that has left healthcare providers with a blind spot in how gender affirming care is provisioned or should be provisioned. Uh, this requires, uh, as I mentioned before, appropriate sensitivity training or TGNC care for all healthcare personnel. So we've come to the end of this section and I'd like to leave you with this. We don't always have to just rely on data or on the survey that we are collecting here, but um, on a day like today, we're really, really lucky to have um, members, uh, not members, but we have a commentary from addition, additional commentary from people who are part of Game Changing Men. And I look forward to hearing their response and their confirmation of the information that we found in this survey. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Vienna. Just uh, what, what you see on the slide is just a recap of all of the findings uh, that was in uh, Vienna's research. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Vienna. <laughs> Next, we will hear from three important voices uh, from community who are collectively and individually uh, doing work to uh, advance the mission of being visible in community. I will introduce them all uh, and they will come in a way that is unique to them. Uh, and so first up, we will have uh, Jamel Ware. Uh, Jamel Ware is an actor, entrepreneur, public speaker, advocate, and educator. His life has taken him down an unconventional path of eclectic experiences, fostering a deep understanding of humanity. Where manages Project Innovate, a micro-grant program of Thrive SS. Through a curriculum he designed himself, he teaches aspiring entrepreneurs, 18 to 29, how to use their brand to reduce HIV stigma. Jamel will speak about reproductive health. Manny Vega is a self-taught chef and artist from Bedford Studevsent, Brooklyn, New York. As a youth, he enjoyed theater and movies. He worked for the Billie Holiday Theater where, where the skill he learned helped him later to become the production assistant and actor to Seven Kings, 2017 Eden's Garden in Atlanta. Manny will speak today about incarceration. And our last speaker today, guest speaker today, is D. Jamel Young, who is a trans advocate and community leader, as well as the founder of TM, TMSM Connect, a Black trans masculine led nonprofit that commits to assisting, affirming, and advocating for assigned female at birth, trans, and gender non-conforming people of color while centering those who identify 
as gay, bisexual, and or queer. And Dee Jamel will talk today about sexual health. Please welcome Jamel Ware, who will discuss reproductive health. So you may be wondering, why is this actor, entrepreneur, public speaker coming to talk to us today about reproductive health? Well, hello, everybody. My name is Jamel Ware, and I am a trans man who gave birth to a child um, May 16th of 2022. So I want to talk to you all about my experience as a birthing parent and how um, this survey really impacts um, the idea of birth of trans men and the ability to give birth in a safe and affirming way. When I decided that my partner and I decided that we wanted to have a child, um, we looked at each other and the first thing we thought about were, well, what resources are there? Fortunately, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, where there are a lot of queer resources. So I was able to go to my OBGYN to find out um, how we could go through this process of having a biological child. My OBGYN is a queer doctor who was able to point, uh, who was able to give me resources, able to point me into directions, and uh, able to really guide us through the process. However, as I decide, began to look for other resources for um, birthing for trans masculine birthing parents, I came, I would hit a brick wall after brick wall. Um, as I would call places to look for resources, folks were very confused about why I was calling. They were always looking to talk to my wife. Um, I was um, be not affirmed and often misgendered. So that made the beginning of this process uh, very difficult. It made me question whether or not I should be doing this because there was only a small group of people that understood who I was, respected who I was and wanted um, and could assist me throughout the process. The other thing I began to look for was community support. Now there is a large community of seahorse dads, and for those of you who do not know, um, in the in, in the 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 creature, the animal, the seahorse, the the, uh, the male is the one who gives birth to the children. So trans men who have given birth are referred to. We refer to ourselves. Let me say that very specifically as seahorse dads. Um, the uh, the thing that we were, I ran into there was that most of the seahorse dads I were finding um, were not black. So I was running into this, this wall again of finding community who understood not only what it means to be a birthing parent or to go on the journey of being a birthing parent, but also who could understand my culture and my distrust of the medical system, et cetera. But the main reason I really was looking in community for was for a doula, someone who could help me navigate the medical system because there was so much fear inside of me. Even though I had a great doctor, I was worried about the nurses. I was worried about the someone else who may potentially have to step in if my doctor wasn't available to for my labor and delivery. Um, I needed someone who could mentally support me and my partner through this process, mentally and emotionally. And that was very difficult to find. Um, the other thing that I ran into were identity challenges. I transitioned about 10 years ago in order to um, reproduce a child, I had to essentially detransition. So for me, that meant I had to stop my testosterone. There are a lot of identity challenges that come along with that. Um, and in being in such a niche community and not having resources and not having a lot of community support, there were very few people for me to talk to through this process. The last thing I want to bring up here was an experience that I had in the hospital. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, I was very lucky to have a very affirming doctor. 
But what we have to recognize is that while it can be possible to find some affirming care, oftentimes the missing point is the front desk. So I had an incident where I was told by my doctor to come into the hospital because I was at danger. I was at danger, my child was at danger. I get to the hospital and I was met with hostility by front desk staff. All of these things tie into the importance of better data around trans masculine reproductive health, because we need to understand better how to support trans men and trans masculine folk. Uh, we need to better train our medical facility, but not just our medical doctors. We have to train our front desk staff. We have to train. I ran into issues with just people coming to deliver food to my room and not that they ever said anything, but the pure shock on their face, which was often distressing for me who was already in a place of distress. Um, um, by the time I hit 34 weeks and admitted to the hospital and not expected to leave until I gave birth. So um, reproductive health really, or I would like to say reproductive justice for trans um, folks is something that needs to be given more um, more attention to because at this moment, Trans men are invisible when it comes to reproductive health. There are not very many safe spaces for us to go to. There are not many affirming doctors for us to visit. Um, and that makes it difficult for us to even assess, assess whether or not, forget the process of giving birth, but whether or not we want to get pap smears, whether or not if we have not had a top surgery, if we are going to get mammograms, are we taking care of ourselves? Because one thing that is true, if you have the parts, we have to get the parts checked out. But if the spaces are not affirming and safe for us, then we are not going to show up. So I would like to end this by saying, there is a strong need for more training within medical facilities from the top to the bottom. There is a need, and I have a list here, so I wanna make sure I don't lose anything. There is a need for a resource guide for trans mass folks. And there's a need for support groups for trans mass folks around reproductive hair. But most importantly, there is need a need for more data around this topic. The data is what drives the ability to create all of these other resources that trans mass folks need when we are seeking reproductive health care. Um, because we want more folks to be able to have the autonomy to use our bodies as I did in the way that we see fit. Because trans folks deserve families, we deserve love, and we have a right to be parents as well. Um, I am very glad that I took the journey of a birthing parent, and also I wish that I was celebrated more. I wish I had more support. I wish I didn't have to lean on one doctor as my sole resource for everything, although I am very grateful that she was there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamel, for your offerings um, and for, for offering your personal narrative. Next, we have Manny Vega, who will provide insight around incarceration. Hi, everyone. I'm Manny Vega. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, the jail system is really not the place that a lot of people want to end up, but when you do, you want to know that uh, you're safe there. The people that are holding you down are supposed to be protecting you as well. My incarceration, uh, excuse me, I may get emotional with it because it's uh, touching uh, <laughs> some. Uh, whew. So I was incarcerated in the South and um, the questions that were asked to me weren't questions that were relevant. So when they asked me, Two questions. Am I a homosexual and do I have HIV? Nothing about sexuality, nothing about how I identify. So I was then uh, moved with the men. 
I was housed with them for over six months. Um, I don't remember exactly how it came about, but they uh, found out that I was intersex AFAB and they decided, okay, we got to get you out of here. So instead of doing something like putting me in a separate cell, they locked me in a cold room. Uh, nobody told me anything, what was going on. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I was in there for a couple of days and um, then they want to take me to the infirmary and uh, they didn't know what they were looking at. So the physicians, the doctors, the nurses, they, were, they had an attitude like I did something wrong. And um, they handled me personally, physically, in a, in a really messed up way, you know? Um, it messed me up to a point where I wound up having to go on suicide watch. I got letters from family and friends that said that the, the jail had uh, leaked out something and I was all over the news and in the newspapers and they had been to my parents' job, you know, so this broke me down even more. And it's like, there was nowhere, no, no resource, no mental health. There was nothing to help me get through that barrier. Then they decided, okay, well, let's stick him with the females. They put me with the females and I pretty much look like the way I look now. The women were very uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. You had CEOs doing a lot of things that um, really put me in a dark place. So the safety, I, I felt none. I felt none. Then you had so-called officers that wanted to be quote unquote on your side and say, well, why didn't you tell me? But you're the same ones over here talking about the stuff you would do if there was a girl up in, you know what I'm saying? Just though I didn't feel safe to disclose anything to anybody. So I wound up in there for six months with the men. When they did change me, it, it put me to a breaking point. And I feel like there should be resources to where in the intake process, they ask you everything else. You got tattoos, you got this, you got that. They need to get down into the identification of people, how people identify, how people uh, wanna be safe. Because when I tell you this mental, this mental uh, trial that I went through, through this whole process makes me know, and still to this day, seeing brothers and sisters getting locked up and not making it out, I'm thankful that I was one of the lucky ones that was able to make it out. And I just feel like there should be somebody in the prison system, the jail system that uh, people of trans experience can, can contact when they're going through the incarceration process because to navigate having to be put with the females, but then looking like this, or even vice versa for the women. You understand what I'm saying? It's a mental anguish on us all. I'm, I'm causing an uncomfortability to the inmates that are already there. I'm uncomfortable. So what's missing from the whole dynamic is them even wanting to understand. Because when I tell you, trying to tell somebody how you identify, and they don't want to listen, it's really hard because then they become angry. And that's what I dealt with, a lot of anger because of not understanding what they were looking at. But before they even asked me what they were looking at, they placed me with the men. You understand what I'm saying? So with, with the lack of education, the lack of training, no, it's, excuse me, I'm sorry. It's just, it hurts to have to try to explain yourself and you're already going through the fact that you're being locked up. You know what I'm saying? And then you have to go through, okay, well now I'm being locked up and they're about to place me here. And how do I go about navigating and telling them my situation and them not take it in a negative sense and try, because the way they portrayed me and I had no control of it, is that I was impersonating a man. 
This is what they documented. There was no interview of me. This was them covering themselves. So I impersonated a man so that I wouldn't have a record. That was what was said. So I just feel that if there was a, I can't even, so I had agencies reach out when they saw the news. Now that would be like game changing men. If you saw the news and you saw this happen to me, but if there was something that was there before it even hit the news that I could have called and asked to help me navigate through the process, I feel like it would have been an easier transition. Yeah, if, if, if I'm making any sense. But um, I'm just, like I said, I'm thankful to be one of the ones that survived that situation. There have been so many that have been killed or just mentally have not returned back to themselves. And I'm thankful for Game Changing Men and uh, a couple of my brothers that helped me get through my day-to-day -day, uh, with this process. Thank you so much, Manny. <clears throat> Next, we will have D. Jamel Young, who will talk about sexual health. You're muted. It would be, it would work if I unmute, huh? Yes. yes. So, um, D. Jamel here. Uh, pronouns he, him, king, and boss. Um, as Marvell shared, I am the executive director and founder of TMSM Connect, which stands for trans men who have sex with men. And today I'm going to share a little bit about sexual health barriers um, and stigma within the trans masculine community. So sexual health, sexual orientation, and sexual expression are often topics that are leaving out the voices and experiences of trans masculine identified individuals. Trans men who are having sexual encounters with individuals assigned male at birth are grossly understudied. This data is essential to helping include trans men in the fight and ending the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Contrary to belief, trans men have the potential to have sexual networks that overlap population dis disproportionately affected by HIV. The lack of knowledge and awareness of the diversity in sexual identity, desires, and behaviors among transgender men who have sex with men or persons assigned male at birth, which will also be referred to as TMSM, leaves the trans masculine community vulnerable and highly at risk. The lack of resources and capacity of HIV prevention and care for TMSM leaves the challenges of trans men not receiving or potentially seeking culturally competent services. Some of the barriers to care for TMSM, I'm sorry, excuse me, some of the barriers to access and affirming medical care for TMSM are healthcare traumas, lack of knowledgeable providers, lack of sexual and reproductive health care services, um, seeking care from providers who fail to conduct an appropriate sexual health ass ass assessment, and limited research that, that access risks, that assess risks and prevention needs. Social and cultural determinants such as unemployment or underemployment, racism, discrimination, homelessness, or a lack of affordable housing and legal document issues are also barriers that the trans masculine community face while trying to access affirming care. And for example, economic vulnerability has led trans men to sex work, which furthermore exposes them to the risk of HIV and other SCIs, in which we heard in the key findings. Trans men tend to avoid public health facilities for fear of how healthcare workers would perceive and treat them. Thouse concluding that stigma also plays a huge role in the gap between connecting TMSM and HIV prevention and care services which directly and negatively impacts their sexual health. Trans men experience stigma in, at multiple levels, highlighting the need for gender sensitive healthcare delivery, stigma reduction interventions, including provider training, non-discrimination policies, support groups, and stigma counseling could strengthen uptake and utilization of preventive services by this marginalized population. As shared in the key findings, destigmatizing de sexuality, gender identity, HIV, and other STIs among trans identifying individuals within the healthcare system is an essential step towards addressing barriers to assessing STI prevention methods and birth control. To combat the harassment 
experienced by trans identifying individuals in the healthcare system, sexual orientation and gender ident identity training can be offered to all healthcare per personnel as part of the routine training. Again, found in the key findings. Some of the recommended HIV STI prevention strategies are supporting TMSM led prevention services, prep and sexual health education for TMSMs and their partners, harm assessment and reduction in integrated care such as peer support groups and mental health services. Trans men are people with hopes, dreams, careers, goals, partners, families, and children, and also deserve access to affirming and knowledgeable healthcare options. To be an ally, ally of the trans and non-binary community, people must first examine their own gender stereotypes, homophobia and transphobia, as well as be willing to defend trans people and celebrate trans lives. The tools and information provided can be also, can be used to educate others about healthcare disparities within the trans masculine community, lived experiences, histories, and concerns. This report is an effort to continue open dialogue and educational conversations that deconstruct social norms around gender, sex, and sexual orientation. Thank you. Can you help me celebrate D. Jamel, Jamel, and Manny uh, for sharing their personal stories and definitely want to celebrate their lives. So thank you so much uh, for sharing your, your narratives with us. Next, we will, we're close to the end of our webinar about the key findings, but want to share with you the key find, I mean, the call to action, a vision for the future. And I will do this in partnership uh, with Quentin Reynolds, uh, who will take visibility, uh, and I will talk about funding and advocacy. Uh, and so first, talking about advocacy, I mean funding, uh, we call upon the philanthropic community to invest more financial support in organizations that serve and where leadership reflects the community of trans men. In this investment, General operating funds allow minority organizations to become more sustainable. And so a pledge from the Southern HIV Impact Fund is to fund more organizations in the South led by trans men. And if there are any other funders or philanthropic organizations on this call, uh, we ask that you pledge that as well. As a commitment to our pledge, we're also excited uh, to announce that we are uh, bringing game-changing men to the main cohort of the Southern HIV Impact Fund, who was previously part of the a smaller alternative cohort. And so we, we're happy to announce that we're uh, giving more funding uh, to game-changing men to ensure uh, more sustainability. Uh, Quentin, you want to take visibility? Yes, yeah, so um, I just want to acknowledge Trans Awareness Week um, as we are talking about uh, visibility. So I, we call upon um, the HIV movement um, to create trans men inclusive strategies to reduce um, new HIV diagnosis. This includes trans men and trans masculine folk being involved on advisory committees as such suspect uh, subject matter expert, experts and consultants. We call upon research institutions to include trans men in their study protocols as participants and to engage regarding, uh, regarding the trans men community with language and recruitment. We ask trans men to be more engaged in clinical trials when they feel comfortable and be visible in any way that you feel to be visible in, whether that be physical or whether that be in just uh, being involved in the clinical trial. Um, so um, to honor um, Trans Week of Awareness, we just ask that you all be visible in whatever capacity is uh, good for you. Next and finally, we have advocacy. We call upon advocacy groups and coalitions to include trans men and trans masculine communities and policy agendas. There are harmful laws and policies being enacted and proposed in the South that impact the lives of trans men. Reproductive justice must include trans men too. As we collectively consider changing the game for trans men, you will find in the report a set of questions that we would like for you to use as your North Star as we work toward a vision for the future. Finally, 
We would like to acknowledge uh, our funders for the Southern HIV Impact Fund who helped make this report possible. Uh, Gilead Sciences, particularly the Gilead Compass Initiative, Veep Healthcare, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Levi Strauss, and Wellsprings Philanthropic Fund. We've also provided for you a QR code so that you might download uh, the full report. Again, the full report is available to you on Age United's website. Uh, that's ageunited.org, as well as Game Changing Men's website. That is gamechangingmen.com. You are able to view this full report on both of those websites. And finally, as we come to uh, the end of this particular webinar, as Quentin talked about, this week is uh, Transgender Awareness Week uh, that ends on November the 20th with Trans Day of Remembrance. And so as we pause in this space and in this moment, um, we remember the names and the faces and not just the number of trans people who've, who've been killed or lost their lives. We remember their names, uh, we remember their faces. And so if we can take a moment of silence. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Quentin Reynolds and Game Changing Men. Thank you to our guest speakers, Jamel, D. Jamel, and Manny for your personal reflection and your sacrifice today. We thank Vienna Mbegaya for your evaluation and your support. And finally, thank Age United staff and the Game Changing Men staff, as well as Dwayne Crowder and A Vision for Hope for your support uh, in this project. Thank you all so much, and please have a safe and happy holiday.